Good morning. morning. Very warm welcome to our service of worship this morning. Can I just remind you to keep two metres apart at all times. If you feel ill, put your hand up, or if anyone you notice feels ill, don't go and help them. Trained people, whoever they are, will come and help. Sanitise on your way out and let the stewards direct you as to when it is safe to leave. Justin returns to his duties tomorrow and today is preaching at St Bryce as their interim moderator. Now that Ken Frood has retired, please keep the congregation of St Bryce in your prayers. After Justin's plea two weeks ago for us all to become more involved in the life of the church in the town centre, please consider volunteering in whatever capacity you can. We really all need to work together and with the other churches if we are to go forward in the next few years. There will be no gift service this year due to the restrictions of the pandemic, but our chosen charity is the Kirkcaldy Food Bank. And further to that, Richard is giving a virtual concert on Friday the 11th at 7pm on YouTube, Facebook and the church's Facebook page. You can watch it for free, but he has set up a GoFundMe page and all monies will go to the food bank if you care to donate. And finally, we welcome back David Murdoch, who will lead us in our second Advent service. Thanks to you, David, for stepping in while Justin has been on holiday. Good morning to you all. As Morag said, this is the second Sunday of the season of Advent. And so our call to worship in a service which will take as its theme, Light Out of Darkness. Our call to worship is this. This is the day of light. Let there be light today. O day spring, in our hearts appear and chase all gloom away. Let us worship God. Although we can't sing these wonderful words of the Advent hymn, nevertheless, we take comfort as we follow them today. First of all, verses 1 to 3, the hymn, O Come, O Come, Emmanuel. And now, as people will do all over the United Kingdom today, we light the second candle of Advent. We wait. We wait for the Lord with longing. And we put all our hope in His Word. 
Let us pray. Loving and living God, if you chose to send your son this Christmas, where would he be born? Would it be in the splendor of a great big royal palace or in the sanitized creche set up in the town square? Or would it be the boutique hotel on the corner or the boardroom in the penthouse suite? Where would he be born? Would it be round the back of Marks and Spencer just by the refuse containers? or on the steps of the railway station, or beside a babbling brook. Where would he be born? And who would see him first? And how would we proclaim the good news? Would the big issue sellers announce it to weary commuters? Or would bells peal out across cities and towns and villages from steeple to steeple? Or would the front page of the Sun newspaper trivialize it and come up with a nasty headline? Would the street pastors hear the news whispered as they wended their way home? But more than likely, people today would be far too harassed to pay heed to angels disguised as humans or too weary to hope for a different song. And Jesus, well, Jesus would feel right at home in our world today, being born into a world of darkness, where people are made homeless because of war and oppression, or unemployment and benefit cuts, where people are hungry and food banks multiply, where soldiers roam city streets in distant lands, where families become refugees, fleeing violence and corruption and sheer injustice. All these are themes that echo through the ages. And yet today on this Advent Sunday, still your people long for something different, for a miracle, a miracle that will bring light, a wonderful, bright, and shining light into all the darkness, bringing hope into despair, and peace where there is none, and love that will overcome all hatred. So come, Lord Jesus, on the second Sunday of Advent. Come to our church here. Come to our community. And come to each one of us. For we make this prayer in the name of Jesus, who taught us when we pray to say together, Our Father, who art in heaven, done on earth. Power and glory forever. Amen. We sing the remainder of the hymn, verses 4 and 5. O come, thou key of David, come.
hear now the word of God. As we turn, first of all, to the book of the prophet Isaiah, chapter 60, and reading from the beginning, a passage known as the glory of Zion. Arise, shine, for your light has come, and the glory of the Lord rises upon you. See, darkness covers the earth, and thick darkness is over the peoples, but the Lord rises upon you and his glory appears over you. Nations will come to your light and kings to the brightness of your dawn. Lift up your eyes and look about you. All assemble and come to you. Your sons come from afar and your daughters are carried on the arm. Then you will look and be radiant. Your heart will throb and swell with joy. The wealth on the seas will be brought to you. To you, the riches of the nations will come. And then at verse 19, the sun will no more be your light by day, nor will the brightness of the moon shine on you. For the Lord will be your everlasting light, and your God will be your glory. Your sun will never set again and your moon will wane no more. For the Lord will be your everlasting light and your days of sorrow will come to an end. Amen. And then we move to the Gospel, to John's Gospel, to a very well-known passage which says this, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was with God in the beginning. Through him all things were made. Without him nothing was made that has been made. In him was life, and that life was the light of men. The light shines in the darkness, but the darkness has not understood it. And then we move to verse 10. He was in the world, and though the world was made through him, the world did not recognize him. He came to that which was his own, but his own did not receive him. Yet to all who received him, to those who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God. Children born not of natural descent, nor of human decision, or a husband's will, but born of God. And so the word became flesh and made his dwelling among us. We have seen his glory, the glory of the one and only who came from the Father, full of grace and truth. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God this Advent day. I said last week that I love this festival of Advent, because in normal times we would sing these wonderfully buoyant, uplifting, and glorious hymns. And of course, we can't do so today. But I'm quite sure that you'll be happy looking at the buoyancy of the words of the hymns, and also perhaps humming quietly behind your masks. Do that now as we look at one of these glorious hymns of Advent, tell out my soul the greatness of the Lord.
Let us pray. Lighten our darkness, we beseech thee, O Lord, that we may see you more clearly, follow you more nearly, and love you more dearly. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. In the bottom drawer of my study desk, I keep a bulging file of old newspaper cuttings about all sorts of things. And I confess very openly that I do so and retain these old and often yellowed cuttings in the often ill-founded belief that someday they might just come in handy as the basis for a sermon. And just occasionally, my magpie tendency for hoarding actually pays off. For the spark of inspiration for this morning's sermon came to me just the other day while I was rereading an article culled from my desk, an article which appeared in the Herald newspaper several years ago. For that article was an in-depth profile of a very popular Scottish entertainer who trod the boards for many, many years and who even appeared in many churches in several presbyteries in his one-man show. But gifted and multi-talented though he undoubtedly was, this Ken Speckle figure and household name never, ever, had his troubles to seek. For as some of you might well have guessed, I'm talking about the popular and much-loved actor and variety star, the late Jimmy Logan. Jimmy Logan, who in his time encountered many hard knocks and bitter blows and days of sheer darkness throughout his life. Let me give you just a few examples of his trouble and strife. First of all, as you will recall, he faced total financial ruin after a dis disastrous attempt to invest his money in a vain bid to preserve Glasgow's Metropole Theatre. And then Jimmy Logan experienced not one, not two, but three marriage breakups. Jimmy Logan who then endured the public humiliation and awful hurt of discovering that the long-awaited children of his last marriage were not genetically at least his. Now, can you just begin to imagine that? Can you imagine his sheer horror at seeing that story splashed in banner headlines in the tabloid press? Because that's how we found out. And as if all of that wasn't enough, Jimmy Logan learned only months later that he was suffering from inoperable liver cancer. What a run of rotten luck, as dark times became his daily lot. Now, quite understandably, many, many people with a run of misfortune like that might very well exclaim, Woe is me! What did I do to deserve all of this? I just can't take any more. Life has let me down and so has God. I simply give up. But not the irrepressible Jimmy Logan. 
Here's what he told the Herald reporter in that press cutting which I was reading. And I quote his words. For they are words of optimism. And they are words of good cheer. I quote, I can now relate to people who have gone to the doctor and the doctor has sat them down and told them, you've got cancer. And Logan continued, I know exactly what they're thinking at that moment. For the first thing you see when it sinks in is, how long have I got? That's what I said. However, since my illness became public, I have been reading letters from many fans and well-wishers. Letters from people saying my husband had cancer for 22 years. 22 very happy years. And I'm getting other letters which cheer me up no end. 15 years, 10 years, 8 years. Oh, it's difficult, all right. But there's no point in living in darkness. There is light at the end of the tunnel. As you sit in the pews this Advent morning, listen to these words again. There is light at the end of the tunnel. Optimistic words, courageous words, inspiring words. Yes, they are indeed. For a life lived in darkness is no life at all. And every single one of us in church this morning needs even the tiniest wee glimmer of light at the end of the tunnel just to give us hope and just to keep us going. And we witness that light again this very day as the second candle of Advent is lit. And that burns brightly alongside the one which we lit last Sunday. And so this morning that yellowed newspaper cutting has compelled me to preach a sermon of preparation for us all as we reach this second Sunday of Advent. For Advent is a marvellous period of the Christian year for it is full of hope and expectation. And most of all it is a festival of light with not a hint of darkness in sight. After all, we don't really like darkness all that much, do we? For many people, physical darkness is a terrible and frightening thing. You remember, instinctively as children, we were pretty afraid of the dark. And some people are still afraid of it and insist, and insist on sleeping with a light on long after childhood has been left behind. Indeed, Paul Burrell, the butler to the late Diana, Princess of Wales, revealed in his daily mirror expose, for which she was paid a fortune, that Diana always slept with a little light on in her room because she feared and she hated the darkness of the night. Now, other forms of darkness can be just as terrible and frightening, moral and spiritual darkness, the darkness of ignorance and prejudice, and sheer human wickedness. Looking around us in the world today, who could really blame us for concluding that the powers of darkness seem to be in the ascendancy? For example, the capacity for hatred between Jews and Arabs in the conflicts ongoing in the Middle East, for racial prejudice where whites and blacks are still at loggerheads in some countries, for religious intolerance, where Roman Catholics and Protestants still battle away, even in some parts of the west of Scotland. For violence, as street muggings are now so commonplace that they're now usually only reported when someone is fatally injured. And we could go on and on and on, cataloguing the many manifestations of darkness in our world and we would end up with a formidable list. But however formidable that list, and however black and gloomy the outlook, the season of Advent which we continue to celebrate this week reminds us very powerfully that the world can never again find itself in a state of total darkness or unrelieved gloom. Why? 
Well, in the opening words of John's Gospel, the question is answered. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. That's why I've taken light out of darkness as our theme for today. You see, that statement of John's that the light shines in the darkness and the darkness has not ever overcome it prompts a very searching question. And the question is, why? Why has the darkness of hatred and prejudice and intolerance and violence and sheer cussedness, why has it never overcome the light? And there are two answers to that question. The first is that Jesus said, I am the light of the world. What a staggering claim. I am the light of the world. He who follows me will not walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. What a staggering claim. For if it were true, it would mean that Jesus was indeed the Messiah and the Savior of the world. Well, with all the benefits of 2,000 years plus of hindsight, I think it's fair to say that we can all now reasonably conclude that it was true. It was true then. And it is true now. Because the account that we have of Jesus' life, the record that we have of his teaching, the details that we now have of his miracles, and the testimony that we now have of his death and glorious resurrection, all these things are consistent with the claim Jesus made when he said, I am the light of the world. Now the crucial thing for us to note here is the way that Jesus points to himself as being the embodiment of the light. He doesn't point to his teachings and say, there's your light. He doesn't point to his miracles and say, look at that, there's your light. He doesn't boast about his conversions, no matter how impressive and numerous they were, and say, there's your light. He says simply and very matter-of-factly, I am the light of the world. You see, Christians are many things. They are believers, servants, disciples, but primarily deep down in every congregation, People who come to church, people who claim proudly to be members of a congregation, they ought to be, first and foremost, followers of Jesus. The way out of darkness, our own personal darkness, whatever that might be, whether doubts or fears or debt or family problems or guilt or drink or drug dependency or anything else, the way out of darkness is to resolutely and sincerely follow Jesus. Jesus, the light of the world. There's a wonderful and meaningful hymn which we're going to sing after this sermon, written by Horatius Bonner, who simply could never have written these words without believing that light, light makes all the difference to our lives. Here's what he said, light of the world, undimming, and unsetting. O oh, shine each mist away. Banish the fear, the falsehoods and the fretting. Be our unchanging day. Jesus said, I am the light of the world. Remember that as you move through Advent. Ah, but what about this year of 2020? Well, I'm afraid that each and every one of us has lived most of it since March, not in the midst of light, but if we're truthful, in the grip of darkness. That is not true just for us and for our country, for it's true for all people throughout the whole world. As I get older, I have become a great believer in down-to-earth and where possible topical preaching, which does not shirk the big issues of life. And so I like to tell it as it is. And I want to spend a few minutes now focusing not on light, but on the many aspects of darkness which have been 
which have affected and which have indeed afflicted us all. In this year, which will be surely listed in the history book in the history books years from now, as 2020, the year of the awful pandemic. For ever since March, we have all been living with uncertainty and fear, with anxiety and deep-seated concerns for our loved ones and for ourselves. And that has meant that many, many of our days have been spent in darkness. Let me list just a few examples of gloom and misery and Stygian darkness, which has dominated all our lives, your lives, and mine this year. First of all, there was the awful shock when the announcement was made in March that a pandemic was on its way. And then we witnessed deaths galore. We witnessed people being ill-advisedly sent to care homes, but many of them died. We watched as cancer sufferers had no chance at all of getting treatment for their illness due to the fact that the NHS was totally overrun. We found family contact almost impossible. Big retail stores collapsed. One-man businesses, totally reliant for their income on their wee business. Many of them went to the wall. Hotels and restaurants and the whole hospitality industry were forced into closure. There were massive job losses throughout the whole country. There was real fear in the hearts of many people, sleepless nights galore. Just a few weeks ago, I happened to be on holiday in Madeira. And in the city of Funchal, normally a most sophisticated, beautiful and clean city, I witnessed something that I never thought I would see before. Never thought I would see again. Because most of the hotels were closed because of the pandemic. And Madeira relies purely on tourism for their income. But what did I see? In virtually every street in that lovely historic city, sitting outside shops, were beggars with little caps in front of them and little placards simply saying, please, please help me. Please help me because I'm hungry and I am afraid. Even in a little island like Madeira, the effects of this ghastly pandemic were really in evidence. And this year has been for many, as if we were really honest, a year of despair and depression and darkness. And yet, despite that formidable list of dark times, I bring you good news. And I bring it this morning on the second Sunday of Advent. Because this year has been filled with man-made darkness, but not spiritual darkness. For people of deep-seated faith know in whom they believe and whom they can trust. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness shall never overcome it. Paul, writing to the Philippians, shrugs off all his horrors, shrugs off the fact that he's been in prison for many years when he says, I can do all things through him who gives me strength. Because he knew that Jesus was the light of the world. And in him, there was no darkness at all. I know, and I greatly regret, as I'm sure you do, that churches are now restricted to minimal numbers. And it's so good to see you here in Abbott's Hall this morning, worshipping in this more modest way, and worshipping with a more modest turnout than normal. It is good that you are here, because after all, it's all a question of faith. Oh, for a faith that will not shrink, though pressed by many a foe, that will not tremble on the brink of poverty or woe. It is good 
to come here and to take comfort from the light of the world. So back to Jimmy Logan. Logan, who having been the victim of terrible times and setbacks galore, was still able to say in all his adversity, there is light at the end of the tunnel. People of Abbott's Hall, that is a declaration of faith, of real faith. And back too to the words of Jesus. Wonderful, inspiring, reassuring words when he said, I am the light of the world. And we had a great example of darkness being dispelled by light just a few days ago. As the launch of the Pfizer vaccine brings hope. Real hope that this ghastly pandemic may soon be tackled and brought under control. Pray then today that your faith will bring you the light of Christ in these Advent days. Put all your faith in Jesus, the light of the world. The one who says, I will never leave you. I will never forsake you, no matter what. And remember that we are all followers of Jesus, the baby of Bethlehem, the crucified of Calvary, and the risen Christ, who is and always will be the light of the world. Over the years, as I think I indicated last week, I have immersed myself in the study of hymnology. And I want to end this sermon by once again going back to Horatius Bonner, that prince of hymn writers. Here's what he said at a difficult time in his life. I heard the voice of Jesus say, I am this dark world's light. Look unto me. Your morn shall rise and all your days be bright. I looked to Jesus and I found in him my star, my sun. And in that light of life, I'll walk till traveling days are done. May we all walk this Advent day and every day in the company of that same Jesus, the light of the world. Amen. And thanks be to God. I've gone back to the old church hymnary because I want us to look at the words of this wonderful hymn, a hymn which has always been a favorite of mine, It's a beautiful tune, which we're going to hear now. But look at the words. Light of the world, forever, ever shining.
For prayers of intercession, let us pray. Gracious and eternal God, when the whole world turns its back against us, you are right there in the midst. And even though darkness overwhelms us, you bring us a word of encouragement in the midst of our distress. When friends disappoint us and even desert us, you stand shoulder to shoulder with us. When we simply don't know where to turn, you reach out and hold us tightly in your everlasting arms. When we are tired and weary, you renew our strength and put a new spring in our steps. Lord God, each one of us has experienced your power, your forgiveness and your love. And though sometimes life has been hard and tough and even mysterious, yet still in our heart of hearts we have always known the joy of a new morning as the sun shone and life took a turn for the better. And we have rejoiced greatly as you offer us a new start, a second chance, and a glimpse of your great glory. And so in gladness and yet in wonder at all you have done for us, so now we pray for other people. People who are facing emotional upheavals of any kind. People who carry heavy and daunting burdens and see no answers in their dark and troubled lives. People who are always discontented with their lot and so are desperately chasing rainbows and deceiving only themselves. People faced with difficult and life-changing decisions and who totter on the precipice of doubt and fear. People who struggle to make ends meet in these dark times and worry about keeping up appearances. And we pray as we always do for people who are sad, and for all those who mourn. Gracious Father, in the peace and the quiet and the loveliness of this sanctuary, we now keep silent as each one of us names those whom we commend to your love and care this Advent day. Lord, in these moments of silence, graciously hear us. Father in heaven, you are a God of compassion, and you alone answer prayer. And so we turn to you once more in the confidence that there is nothing, nothing at all, that can ever separate us from your wonderful love in Christ Jesus our Lord. And so, Lord, hear our prayers, and stretch out your hands in healing, and in power, and in comfort, and in love to all those for whom we have prayed today. And help us all to work, to walk worthily of you and of your great mercies in the week that now stretches before us and the joys which it will bring. Lord, hear our prayers and bless us all. Amen. I'd like to send you out with a spring in your steps. And so we listen to the wonderful music of Advent. Lo, he comes with clouds descend. <laughs>
Those of you who are able, please stand for the benediction. Go forth with joy on this Advent Sunday and walk in the light of the Lord who walks with each one of us in every single step of our journey of life. And the blessing of God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit be with us now and dwell in our hearts forever. Amen.